who shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Hmm, look around. So today, my dear ones, we're going to explore a different kind of power, the power of humility and the strength that's found in gentleness, all of these allusions to water and flow, it's that yin energy. And I think about the rise of a different kind of energy within the world and within nations in these times including ours as we approach the election season, that often equates strength with dominance, domination over it's kind of a stereotypical male energy. And we're called to a deeper understanding of what it means to be truly strong. So Psalm 1 offers some guidance. And it was a sung piece um, from the Hebrew scriptures three, 4,000 years ago. And again, these were probably written by men and the message might have been for strong, um, powerful men, a message of how to lead. And so imagine this sung, blessed is the one who delight, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on this law night and day. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yield fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Picture that image rooted deeply and connected to something that's flowing and alive and reaching upward, interdependent, cannot live without the waters, cannot live without the sky, and yet stand strong, this connected, connectedness. It's this vision of humble strength, a person rooted in divine wisdom nourished by living waters, bearing fruit in due season. And so I want to explore how this humble strength manifests itself in our lives and in our relationship with others. Humble strength. Does that seem like a paradox to you? Humble strength. It's at the heart, I think, of our faith. And I'd like to share two personal stories about humility. Um, and the first story is about being in a context where I was meant to feel less than. So it was my first week as a senior financial analyst with Hewlett Packard's $500 million business segment. I was 24 years old, fresh out of graduate MBA program, and I walked into a room full of older, much larger men. There were no other women. And one of the team members even asked me, are you sure you're in the right meeting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I remember just taking a couple of deep breaths because it got to something. There was something that had already been telling me for many historic reasons, no, you don't belong here. And I took a breath and I smiled and I said, I understand your surprise, but I assure you, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. But I felt very alone. I needed a bridge over my troubled water. So flash forward in time, after a few months of listening and learning and contributing as much as I could, even though there were more times than I'd like to say that I experienced being treated as other, we successfully completed our forecasting cycle. And surprisingly, that same team member came to me and he said, I owe you an apology. You taught me that ability has nothing to do with what you look like, how old you are. It's about your ability. And I learned 
you know, what we often misunderstand as humility is always subjugating yourself, always being less than, which really hurts marginalized groups if they already feel less than, unworthy. I learned that humility is about creating an environment where everyone, including yourself, at those times when you feel marginalized, can contribute their best. Leading with humility, curiosity, and mutual respect. And it's not easy. Second, more recent example. Many of you know me well, and you know at times I sometimes take on too much or just do it myself or become perfectionistic, impatient, overly focused on tasks and log logistics, and less focused on people, especially people who are volunteering. And I'll never forget when a dear volunteer came up to me directly and gently said, Pastor Lori, lately it feels like you're more concerned with what we can do than who we are. This is a gift. It's a wake-up call. This direct and timely feedback prompted me to reassess the priority of relationships and to express gratitude more often. Sometimes I get into that mindset, I'm still back in a company or something. These are volunteers. These are people giving out of the heart because they want to. And I learned that humility lies in our strength to be able to listen, become more self-aware, not be so afraid of hearing what we might not want to hear, to grow not only as a person, but actually to grow closer in trusting relationships with one another. So what does humble strength look like in our daily lives? Listening, listening, listening more than speaking, giving credit to others, taking responsibility for failures, being willing to apologize, to compromise at times, and at times to put others' needs first. I think there's something about beginner's mind. Remaining curious, recognize we really don't know. Another aspect of humility that I've come to realize is I have no idea what you are thinking. I have no idea what's gonna happen, that's true. Remaining curious, being aware of our assumptions, questioning them being open to changing our minds. And as a pastor in pastoral care, what I've really learned is that oftentimes I do not know what someone else needs. And what I need to do is listen and be present. So I have another story to share with you that deeply shaped my understanding of humility, the strength of humility. So over 25 years ago, when I was a baby minister as an interfaith chaplain, I once sat with a mother who was from Jamaica. She was first generation immigrant and we were in the ER. Her son, Steve, lay motionless. He was connected to a respirator. I'm sorry, that was in the ICU, not the ER. He was connected to a respirator. And I found out from a couple of the nurses before I went in that he was technically brain dead. He had died of an aneurysm. But the doctors hadn't arrived yet to officially announce it. His, his um, medical doctor was in the ER with another patient. And so the nurses were aware, but this mother wasn't. And I watched her sitting by his bedside. She had her hand on his leg and she was watching as this, he was breathing in and out, but it was the respirator, not her, her beloved son. She was hoping that he was still alive. I had no idea what to do, but I saw her hand and I held it. 
and we just sat there. No platitudes, no false assurances, just presence. And you know me from my, it's like, what am I doing, doing, doing? I'm being. I was just being. And when the doctor finally came to deliver the news, she just collapsed to the floor. And I just held her like a baby. And she wept. I didn't know what I was doing. And then more and more family arrived, and they were all sent to this private room, and this mother and I joined them. So I thought, I know a lot about theology. And something, gratefully, especially as this was primarily Jamaican people and as a white woman, I thought, I had this urge to offer words of comfort or spiritual insight, but something gratefully held me back. Instead, I joined this circle, sitting next to this mother, holding her hand still, and I watched the extended family arrive, bringing with them the aroma someone had made fresh coconut bread. And the aroma filled the room, and they shared the bread and the juice and their presence. And I was part of this circle. They shared their memories of this beloved Steve who was only 38 years old. And in this moment of deep grief, I witnessed something incredibly beautiful unfolding. A young pregnant woman, she was really pregnant, um, and she was the cousin of Steve, and she suddenly spoke up with her hand on her belly and with tears in her eyes, she said, now I know the name of my son, Stephen. The room was full of tears, some sobs, some gentle laughter, because Stephen was a pretty rowdy type. <laughs> and in their own way, this family was finding comfort, honoring their loved one, and looking toward the future. This experience taught me the profound power of humble presence and cultural respect. By stepping back and allowing the family to grieve in their own way, I witnessed a moment of healing that no sermon or theological discourse could have possibly provided. Sometimes the strongest way to serve is to just be there, bearing witness to another's pain without trying to fix or explain it. I think so often in our eagerness to help, we often rush to solutions to offer solutions or comfort, but who are they for? I think humility and pastoral care, which is something that we all give to one another, often requires us to step back, to listen deeply, to allow space for others to find their own path through grief and toward hope. So it continues, I, my social location as a white, cisgendered, heterosexual, middle-class woman, I am on a lifelong journey of learning that my understanding of humility must expand to encompass the experience of those with all kinds of marginalized identities. And for groups that have faced systematic oppression, Humility isn't about self-diminishment. It's about honoring one's identity while working toward collective justice. I've learned and I'm still learning that true humility often means stepping back 
to amplify the voices of the marginalized people rather than to speak for them as if I knew. It involves recognizing the complex intersections of identity, including race, class, gender, and sexuality. It means admitting what we don't know and when we need help and committing ourselves to ongoing learning. And that allyship often involves sitting with discomfort and being willing to have hard conversations. So where do we begin? How do we cultivate this in our own lives? Especially when it's so tempting in this political climate to show a different kind of what we delude ourselves into thinking is strength. And I invite you, I'm going to lift some steps. I invite you to just take one this week. Truly hear others without waiting for them to finish so you can say what you wanted to say. I've done that. Admit when you're wrong and when you need help. Help others without expecting any notice or anything in return. Influence through your actions alone. Rejoice with others genuinely. Set aside your ego. Pray, meditate so that you can become more aware, more conscious of your own ego-driven thoughts. Ask for feedback and give it graciously. Be open and curious, regardless of your level of expertise. So some questions for you as we wrap this up. Where do you find it easy to practice humble strength? Where do you struggle? You know where you struggle. You know what your strengths are. And true greatness, remember, isn't about being first. It is about standing with the marginalized one. In Jesus' time, it was children. Not so sure they're so marginalized now. Some are. Whoever that one is, stand with them. Be that bridge over troubled water. And standing firm in one's own worth and dignity while recognizing the interconnectedness with all creation, like a tree planted by the waters. And so my prayer is that we all listen, serve, respond with gentleness, and speak with humble confidence against injustice, and that we may go forth in humble strength, gentle power, transforming the world one act of service, one person at a time, and in doing so to trust that we become co-creators of a more just, compassionate, sustainable world. Amen. Thank you.